Hi, hi, Girish. Hi, hi. How are you? Okay. I'm fine. How are you? Good, good, good. Um, we'll continue our discussion on this um, on this whole concept of pramana and different pramanas uh, to to verify, you know, the truth value of a statement. If you uh, yeah, um, and so on. Uh, now this is. as i described to you there are primarily all the indian darshanas except uh, except charvaka um, uh, among the vedic darshanas they accept three pramanas okay one darshana yeah. one pramana which everybody accepts is pratyaksha there is no, no there is no uh, dispute about that but of course they might give some uh, i'll discuss where why there can be some discussion about that also uh, when the uh, whole proof depends only on pratyaksha then uh, even that is minutely examined now what i am telling you is just the basic definition it is just like mathematics basic definitions look very simple but then a whole uh, body of work in mathematics depends on those uh, definitions and the and the um, interpretations their domain of validity etc etc and uh, in fact one uh, when i was in uh, kanpur uh, iit i was very much interested in studying uh, uh, you know higher mathematics uh, more than what was being taught for us in uh, physics uh, mathematical physics class so i had a friend and i i started attending some uh, msc maths classes i couldn't understand anything then i asked him to give me uh, suggest a book because i was interested in what is called functional analysis and so on abstract uh, in the part of the abstract algebra and i couldn't go beyond the first page you know it is just a bunch of definitions now uh, and then uh, they set up definitions and then they start uh, building up the whole uh, structure uh now so i asked him and he made a very very valuable uh, comment to me he said whenever a definition is given to you of any concept what you have to look at is definition by itself uh has a limitation okay there is something called domain of validity of that definition where it it will be precise and where it can't be precise but when it is stated in just three four lines you think that oh it has been defined and all that okay so in the as a beginner you think okay everything is cut and dried and this is what it is and of course uh, people can uh, as you go on people can uh, start questioning each word in the definition you know what do you mean by this where have you defined this word and where have you defined that word etc but leave that aside even in the normal definition what he said is when somebody defines a concept to you or explains a concept to you or defines something you what you learn a lot by looking at where this definition may not apply okay where this definition can fail so th- keep thinking of uh, situations where this definition will not apply now if you do that rigorously in your own mind then you will reach a stage where either you will find that there are no exceptions to this rule to this definition okay or you will find cases where this definition doesn't apply both are very important for your understanding of the subject deep understanding of the subject because by one when you found that there is this is uh, almost invariably with whatever example or whatever situation you could think of this applies then that means your belief in that or your uh, your uh, faith in that definition or or its uh, its uh, precision becomes even more solid and if you have found cases where it doesn't apply then that really like either you have made a discovery or you have found something which is very important which is what is called the domain of validity so something may be true but it may be true in a certain limited domain and not in all the thing i mean to give a good example uh, from physics for example you know newtonian physics ruled uh, from 1700s to 1900 okay 200 years newtonian physics uh, ruled the physics and then that uh, consequences of that uh, in fact this whole uh, you know mechanical way 
machinery and mechanics and mechanical way of looking at things all that are consequences of you can say newtonian uh, uh, thinking but uh, and it was verified where again and again and again <clears throat> and it turned out to be true right and uh, in fact uh, the, when they, he applied it to motion of uh, planets etc uh, and explained the motion of planets uh, why they would be doing like this and and hence he postulated that there is a something called force of gravity and that gravity is goes according to this law 1 over r squared etc inversely proportional to the square of the distance between two masses and so on you could still say okay he just explained what already kepler had found about a couple of hundred years ago that planets go around in an elliptical orbit now he has found some mathematical way of explaining by first postulating that there is some gravitational force between two objects and that force follows this 1 over r squared law, then he can show that this moves in elliptical uh, orbits, etc. That Kepler's laws, uh, which were empirically observed, now they can, you can actually, uh, you have a derivation of it. But what did you have to postulate for that? The fact that there is something called gravity, which is an attractive force between two masses, okay, and that force is uh, follows uh, is proportional to uh, 1 over r squared, where r is the distance between two masses. So these two new postulates have come in to so-called explain this. Okay, it is elegant, it is very nice. But then the real triumph of Newtonian celestial, this is called celestial mechanics, because it is dealing with the planets and uh, celestial objects, came when they were looking at uh, some really distant planets because some by that time you know Galileo it's himself had discovered had invented the telescope and telescopes were being used to look at planets and all that okay now Galileo is the first one he he observed the um, the uh, satellites of Jupiter and so on and so forth right now so by bare eyes that that seen what is called Shukra Mangala Buddha etc okay Mercury and Venus and Mars etc. And Ju even Jupiter, but beyond Jupiter, they are not seen. So then later, the Neptune and Uranus were discovered. And one of them actually came about because one could be, one planet could be seen, the next planet. I don't remember now whether it is Uranus or Neptune. Okay. And then that planet was not following the Newtonian uh, orbit perfectly. There are some variations in that. Now, you could you can say okay Newton's uh, uh, laws are not applicable here or some problem is there with Newton's laws. Another way used to uh, another approach was also taken by some people who said that no no Newton's law is universal law it 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 has to apply but fact that this is this is not behaving according to Newton's law means there may be another object which is disturbing it. Okay, another object which is disturbing uh, the th you know disturbing the path of this particular planet. Okay, and lo and behold, after some time, they actually discovered that another planet which was disturbing the uh, motion of this. So that really confirmed that was the real test where P the just that uh, that you could say the wobbly motion of one planet. Okay, led to the because of the belief or the correctness of Newton's law, you can say, led to the discovery or prediction of a, a new planet and which was later observed. Okay, so this was a great achievement. Now, when we say later, 200 years later, when Einstein postulated relativity, okay, and then that was verified and so on and so forth, then people think that Einsteinian physics Okay, disproved Newtonian physics. That's not true. What actually happened is Einstein showed that Newton, Newtonian physics is being verified time and again. Only thing he showed is when you have very fast moving objects, objects which are moving at half the velocity of light or three-fourths the velocity of light or very close to velocity of light. And velocity of light is a is you know is a massive thing, right? Three lakh kilometers per second. So any object moving at 3 lakh kilometers per second or anything close to that, even let us say 2 lakh kilometers per second, will not follow Newtonian mechanics, Newtonian physics. This is, whereas it will follow Einstein's 
relativistic equations. But if that was moving at 200 kilometers per hour, let us say a very fast car, okay, 200 kilometers per hour, or a jet plane, right? A jet plane normally about 1100 kilometers per hour or a little less than that. A supersonic goes faster than that. Let us say 2000 kilometers per hour, hour, 2000 kilometers per hour. In all those cases of the fastest possible everyday motion that we see of big objects, Newtonian mechanics is perfectly valid. Newtonian mechanics only fails when you look at particles or bodies which are moving at these phenomenal speeds of very close to velocity of light. So Einstein showed that his equations will reduce to, will give the same uh, result as the Newton's equations when the velocities are very small compared to velocity of light. Okay. So this is called, so he didn't disprove Newton. He showed the limitation of Newton, where Newton's theory is valid and where it is not valid. Okay. So this was, so this is the way, so he didn't disprove Newton. So Newton is valid. That's why every day, I mean, when we talk about Mangalyan, Chandrayaan and all that, those orbits are calculated uh, of course, uh, nowadays they use computers. At one time, they were hand calculated, uh, even by NASA. Uh, but now, uh, with the computers and all that, uh, you do numerical calculations, but basically using Newton's equations. Okay, not not uh, Einstein's equations. So, what I'm trying to say is that that is why when you are looking at, it's very important to look at any law or any definition, key where it applies and where it doesn't apply. What is the domain of validity? So this is just uh, um, something which he, uh, this uh, ma mathematician friend of mine, um, were colleagues, uh, I was in physics, he was in mathematics, really stuck to me. And if we start applying it where, in whatever subject we are studying, because many times what happens is we, um, for analytical purposes, we have to define certain things. Okay, we have to break down a complex phenomena into sub parts. And and uh, and then reduce even how these parts interact and how these parts move, etc. And what is the relationship, etc. To, to if you want to reduce it to some general principles, which uh, general properties of these objects. For example, in the case of uh, fluids and gases and things like that, people discovered there's something called pressure, volume, and temperature. Okay, now these are macroscopic parameters, but Using these three concepts, they were able to study the uh, the the laws which um, liquids and particularly gases follow. Okay, now if you but at the same time, if you say, oh, this is good, this is Charles' law, this is Boyle's law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you say, what is this temperature? Okay, oh, they said, oh, temperature is so obvious. No, it is a measure of heat. No. If something is cold and something is hot. So what is different? Temperature is different. One is higher temperature, one is lower temperature and so on, right? Now, at the same time, when people got into a microscopic explanation of these laws, which was called kinetic theory of gases, they didn't look at gas as something, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an object in itself, but they said, oh, it's all made up of these molecules which are flying around, you know, and uh, within a boundary, they're flying around uh, a container and so on, Okay. Now, so, what is temperature then? Temperature is the average, uh, you know, uh, based on the average kinetic energy of these uh, molecules, etc. Right? So, it, you can't talk about temperature of one molecule. So, only when you have like a very large n number of molecules, you know, very large number, that uh, you can talk about the average kinetic energy of those. So one, one molecule may be moving very small, very slowly, one may be moving very fast. But on the average, whatever it is moving at, that is related to the temperature of the gas, etc. Okay. So, this that's where you learn. Temperature of a single thing doesn't exist. Single system doesn't exist. Only when you have an ensemble, uh, when, only when you have many parts, particles participating in that, then you can talk about averages, right? Um, and so on. So, uh, I mean, that's a normal thing. Uh, uh, when you say birth rate is 2.1 means what? Birth rate is 2.1. It doesn't mean there is a 0.1 baby being born somewhere, right? It's an average. 
right? It's the rate of uh, growth and so on. When you have a billion people and you you see how many new babies have been born this year, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That, on that basis, birth rates, etc. So there, those are averages uh, and um, um, based on the uh, macroscopic data. Why I'm saying all this is that if we do not look at these definitions carefully and see their limitations also, then we'll start applying it them wrongly and we'll start making a lot of mistakes. In fact, a lot of the mechanical thinking happens when you look at these definitions not as tools and you're not you and you're not and you're not understood the limitations of these definitions and the usefulness of these definitions. So either you go to one extreme saying, oh, nothing can be defined, everything is so complex, nothing can be described, nothing can be analyzed. Okay. Uh, so there is uh, there is nothing called a law of anything. Okay. Each person is unique, each phenomenon is unique, etc., etc. Or you go to the other extreme and say that here you have got this law and here you got this theory and you got these concepts and this thing and everything uh, should follow this. And when you look at one object which doesn't follow this, then you, <laughs> you, you do not question your limitations of your definitions, but you say that, oh, why is that person not following this? He should be following, uh, you know, uh, he should be, instead his behavior uh, is strange and all that. It's not strange. I mean, you're trying to describe that behavior of a microscopic large number of uh, bodies, let's say a society, or a, even a, um, uh, you know, or a physical uh, object with many, many parts, uh, or a society which is, you know, uh, lakhs and crores and uh, people with uh, each having their own uh, uh, different, different uh, um, backgrounds, uh, different, different intellectual abilities, different, different uh, uh, wealth, uh, different, different uh, um, jobs they are doing and uh, they have a different, different consciousness. Each person has will have a different way of approaching it. But at the same time, you can say, oh, there is something called, you know, Indian way of looking at it or the, oh, Americans think like this. What do you mean by Americans think like that? Right. It is some, some uh, uh, you can say, you can call it a stereotype, but you can also say some in some play ways, the, these kinds of general, uh, defini uh, you know, trends might help you. But you can't take it to the extreme saying, oh, show me which person actually thinks like this. Okay. But on the whole, you may be able to describe the behaviors of, of uh, large many body systems by looking at certain um, characteristics, uh, which are characteristics of the many body. So you cannot ascribe it then to a single person and say, oh, does why does this person think like this? Mm -hmm. Oh, he comes from this. They are twin brothers. They grew up in the same family. You know, they had uh, the same uh, atmosphere, cultural atmosphere, um, physical atmosphere, uh, the standard of living, etc. But why are they different people? Why do they think differently, etc., etc.? Okay, because then you are talking about individuals. But if you are looking at, oh, if you are looking at broadly, then you can talk about, oh, this person comes from, oh, when we say, nah, oh, this is middle class way of looking at things. Okay. What do you mean by middle class way? <laughs> okay. Middle class approach or middle class values and so on. What do you mean by that? That means you have actually created certain macroscopic trends. Right? Uh, you should not look at, try to look for them in each individual member of the so-called middle class. When that concept of middle class itself is a very broad thing. Then you can't say, does this person, where does that, they don't have sharp boundaries. Okay. There are, there are things where things overlap and so on. So, um, uh, smoothly merge into other. It's like saying, um, draw a sharp boundary between Maharashtra and Karnataka. If you are going to say this side is Kannada speaking, that side is Marathi speaking. No, it doesn't happen that way. Not only in the same house, you might have different uh, people speaking different languages or one person speaking multiple languages and so on and so forth. So how you can't draw those lines, right? So similarly, many definitions have overlaps and there are no sharp boundaries. So uh, you have to be careful about this. Why I'm saying this is, so now we talked about definition of the pratyaksha, observation, right? Anko deki, what our senses say something. And based on that, you you uh, you, uh, you come to certain knowledge or you come to certain conclusion. Now second, now can this be questioned? No, no, it is unquestionable. I have seen it with my own eyes, right? Fine. 
instead this is better more definitive than what is called hearsay somebody else telling you that they saw something okay this is better right so you say ah nene ma khud dekha hu right i am i was a witness to that and so but then if you look more closely you want at this it is not so sharp i mean you can see something and it could be an illusion it could be a mirage right or there may be a, 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 after all this is an instrument right it is a eye is an instrument you may you might your eyesight may be good may not be good you may be myopic you may not be able to see clearly you might have a, a cataract you might have a blurred uh, vision right or uh, you might see something which appears like something but which, which is not what it is right this what is called a mirage right in the sand uh, hot desert sand or even sometimes hot uh, tar roads you suddenly th- see some wavy things so you you might think that there's water there but when you go there you don't find any water right but uh, nothing but hot uh, air moving and uh, that leading to certain optical illusions right or and this is uh, in fact this kind of a uh, uh example is given many times especially in the shankara's advaita vedanta this is what is called the famous uh, dichotomy is it is it a rope or is it a serpent okay a uh, uh, rope might appear like a serpent and you think it is serpent but then when you go close you might find no 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 it's not a serpent it's a rope <laughs> right and so on so even pratyaksha you will have to think very carefully that that pratyaksha the process of that pratyaksha itself like in the in the case of uh, physical measurements we say we always talk about error in measurement we always talk about errors associated with a particular instrument you say this microscope has this this kind of a resolution right beyond that we cannot say right and even this when you take a reading there are certain limitations so you always give an error plus minus this right so uh so like this so you should be aware when you talk about your results you have to be aware of what are the error margins involved in that these are not precise okay because instruments add their own error process of measurement add their own error and then there are statistical errors that means the same measurement made through by the same instrument by the same person might give slightly different result at a, done at another time so you do these measurements over a period of time and then uh, or number of measurements you make and then you say okay there is this uh, there is a certain statistical variation in this so this could be this is the um, uh, you know whole field of statistics is involved in that mean and standard deviation etc etc right so similarly uh, uh, um, uh, this is that's the equivalent of saying you know am i sure this what i saw did my eye uh, where my eyes good enough because somebody else didn't see it maybe somebody else saw slightly something different okay and so on so there are limitations even when we talk about observation whether it is physical observation in a laboratory or just plain uh, looking at a problem or looking at you know looking at the phenomenon uh, what is happening in front of you okay so this is just one part of it now then when you are talking about the second one we said when it is that kind of knowledge is not available that uh, way of verifying something is not available then you say that you guess you guess like uh, we talked about this famous example that is given that where there is smoke there must be fire why because you saw that in uh, maybe in your kitchen or somewhere in your own house that uh, when the fire was lit there was some smoke now of course there will be people who will say i have found fire without any smoke and they'll give you some examples of fire means what it is heat and all that suppose you take a red hot iron okay there is no smoke but you touch it it is hot right so so it is the same as fire what do you mean by fire it gives you heat you put your hand it get burnt you touch a red hot iron it will get burnt but there is no smoke and so on right so the all kinds of counter examples are given to say that there are there can be fire without smoke but then they find that but if there is smoke then certainly there may be fire in your own experience you have found that when there was smoke in the kitchen there was fire also so now people say oh the i can see smoke coming from that forest far away which means there must be some fire there kuch to hai 
you know some explosion has happened or some uh, you know or just some wildfire may be there or somebody may be just camping there and created a small fire which is you know and so on right why because all you are able to see is just a smoke so this inference is another way right of of guessing what could be happening there so that is based on your own experience right so if in your experience for example something you have seen what happens here in your society in your uh, street in your village and then you know the cause effect relationship here because you have seen it then somewhere else you just see the effect so you say oh the cause must be the same because why because in my village that cause led to this effect right so oh kashmir mein ye hua ha ah, must be it is because of this this cause why because in my village when that happened that was the cause so this is a kind of uh, you can say the secondary way of guessing of verifying something or believing in something or finding something uh, may be true this may be true because you know uh, after all uh, I, i can't go to kashmir and check out what is happening there but from here if i want to verify something is true or not true or make a model or uh, make a theory that what could be happening there then this is what may be happening why because my experience in my place is this now you can argue saying that oh kashmir is different and your village is different okay or you can also <laughs> argue that it's not necessary that one effect leads to one cause leads to one effect there may be other causes leading to the same effect and so on okay so uh, or multiple causes leading to one effect uh, uh, and uh, and so on so you may not be able to uh, you are uh, associating only one cause with that effect may be wrong and so on okay so this is the second uh, um, uh, this is greatly debated and discussed among within the indian philosophers by buddhists by nayakas and the people who refined this this pramana shastra this is called though pramana method is used by everybody to argue their case argue their interpretation argue their world uh, outlook etc or their model but the people who really refined it to a great extent were the nayakas or the followers of nyaya sutra or who who that uh, thing is called nyaya that uh, darshana is called nyaya now uh, then uh, of course now uh, why this is important i think we are coming to the um, very close to this thing so i'll just say uh, the the third one uh, we mentioned last time that when both these uh, are not able to resolve a, a dispute or a disagreement then the third pramana you might use is veda pramana now this only the vedic philosophers or the astika philosophers will follow this method okay and different people use it for different uh, uh, extent for example the vedantis whether they are the advaita vedantis or dvaita vedantis or the vishishta dvaita vedantis okay these are different vedantas who rely on the certain um, statements Uh, their their whole analysis is based on the on the you can say primarily on the upanishads so when they say veda actually it is upanishads because and then they say that upanishads are the anta vedanta okay the last part of vedas though people have f- uh, figured out that there is a long historical period between the rigveda and the let us say the upanishads uh, upanishadic period in between there have been uh, several other texts which have been found which are uh, older than upanishads and uh, uh, but uh, after uh, vedas like aranyakas and brahmanas and so on okay now uh, but this whole period this whole approach is now called uh, normally called vedic and so upanishads are included in the uh, vedic and then upanishads are also called where the philosophy becomes primary uh and whereas uh, the the stress in the vedas is more on the rituals so that is called karma kanda and this is called gnana kanda okay so philosophization starts here so there are some uh, uh, important uh, discussions and a lot of debates happen within the upanishads but there are certain vakyas there which are like uh, have are considered as profound vakyas uh, aphorisms and they are co- they are called mahavakyas 
Now, in the Vedantis, normally base they start with their argumentation from this, this Mahavakyas. They say this is true. So, whether now let me construct my theory to explain that. Okay, so it's, they start from the uh, text. They start from the Upanishadic Mahavakyas and then they they're, they're, uh, and they start interpreting it. The only um, uh, disturbing thing is that if something is a pramana, normally when, when you say something is a pramana, because that will make sure, that will tell you whether something is true or not true. Right? So it should be precise. It should be unambiguous. But here we find that these are actually linguistic statements. Right? Expressed in a language. Some complex set of concepts explained in a language. Right? A philosophical uh, or a metaphysical statement expressed in language. So then, how do we interpret this language? This language? So are there multiple interpretations of the same Vakya? And it, it happens to be so. So all the three uh, Vedantic uh, major traditions, that is Advaita, Dvaita and Vishishta Advaita, they all like start with the same vakyas, but reach three different uh, um, uh, systems. And not only that, later I found out that we think Advaita Vedanta is Shankara, what is done by Shankaracharya, right? Uh, but there have been many types of Advaita Vedantas who have come later who are who differ from Shankara. There is one by Abhinav Gupta, there is one by Nimbaraka, there is one by Bhratruhari. There is even uh, uh, another one by, um, uh, let's say, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, and, and so on. So there are there are six or eight Advaita Vedantas. Okay. So this is what is disturbing to people who, uh, if you are looking at from from a science angle, from science angle, you say if you are taking, like for example, the scientist might today con ex uh, consider theory of relativity and quantum mechanics as the Veda. Okay, what does that mean? If somebody proposes another theory, first thing you will check is whether it uh, it, uh, it is uh, it follows or uh, uh, it violates the quantum mechanics or the uh, principles of relativity. If it does, then his first approach will be to reject it. But then if the other person says, no, Baba, please listen to me, it may look like it is, uh, uh, it is violating. Yeah, it is violating. But... I am able to explain more things from my theory than what your quantum mechanics and relativity explains. Okay. And it can be verified. So on. That is a tough fight. And just like Einstein had to fight to show that, you know, his approach was very different. So it took a long time for people to understand his approach. Okay. And become an accept, uh, accepted theory. But he was able to show and then with, and uh, not just in theory, later experiments were done. We showed that that he, yes, uh, his theory is, explains more things than Newton's theory. And though it is very different from Newton's theory. So then Einstein's theory became the Veda. <laughs> okay. Now, only difference, uh, we'll come to that, we'll discuss this later, is that in science, there is nothing which is infallible. So, Newtonian mechanics was considered infallible. Later it turned out that it is fallible. Einstein showed that his theory is different. And uh, there are areas where Newton's theory fails. They can't explain, right? And maybe uh, 50 years, 100 years later or whatever, some new phenomenon comes and that cannot be explained by Einstein's theory and some new theory comes. So this kind of a succession of theories which widen the domain of validity of their of these theories, which uh, something which is considered universal, suddenly you find, no, no, it's not universal. It applies only in this domain, right? And so on. So that is the way science approaches. So though they, it also respects accumulated knowledge or verified knowledge like relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, let us say in physics, right? This, uh, this is verified knowledge. So it, it will look at it as Veda. But it is not immutable. It is not infallible. Okay. Whereas in the case of Veda Pramana, the Vedas are considered the ultimate. Not only ultimate, it has not been created by human beings. It is a Purusheya. It was just revealed to certain sages. So this is a major difference. So nobody will say that, you know, there is a possibility that uh, within the Vedic system, nobody will argue, argue against it. But at the same time, there are these other systems who do not say that Veda is a, is, a, is a pramana with which, you know, is our ultimate pramana. 
the jains don't accept veda as ultimate <laughs> pramana buddhists don't accept uh, veda as ultimate pramana and the charvaka also rejects uh, veda as ultimate pramana okay so anyway we'll continue this discussion it's a, a very interesting thing but what i find in this whole discussion the method is also very important which means many times in a normal discussion people start saying uh, you know make some statement if it is a serious if it is just you know you don't start uh, uh, if it is a, a you know a passing comment uh, okay you don't care but if it is a serious meeting serious discussion something is being point is being discussed and somebody says something then you may it may not appeal to you or you may not agree with it then instead of saying you are wrong first thing you should ask is what is the basis of your conclusion what is the pramana you are using on what basis you have come to this conclusion okay that is a polite way that is a correct way of having a discussion okay that we uh, talked earlier about vada and all that is but in the this this is the simplest method of vada is asking for pramana in fact i my understanding is the word pramanik when we say somebody is pramanik okay we normally we think he is honest but actually what it means is whatever he is saying it is based on some pramana and he he can he can explain it <laughs> okay anyway so uh, so this brings in rigor in any discussion and then that other person will realize oh yeah this is my opinion this is my feeling this is what i feel this is what i think okay there is no other uh, he's uh, if he is unable to get uh, pramana for it or explain that pramana clearly then he will also go back and think more about it maybe he will change his view or maybe he will he will understand the situation better by digging more into the what could be the reason is his model correct or not his explanation correct or not etc so this method of asking for pramana is very important just like in in the in the in science this all the time this is assumed when somebody is writes a research paper you want that you know the, the, there is a consistency in the model and the model should make certain predictions and that should be verifiable by experiment okay so you have to give experimental verification for your uh, consequences for your theory right so you say that is a basis so that is what we say when we say talk about evidence based discussion <laughs> evidence based knowledge okay uh, so uh, we will continue this discussion uh, in the uh, again yeah